Masonic Life Podcast. This is Past Master Moira calling with my review critique of episode 111 entitled Don't Be Gross with guest Brian Smith, registered nurse. This was a really good episode. You guys are back to your usual format. Last couple episodes were a little different, a little short, but with the holiday season and the pandemic, that's to be expected. Anyway, Brian was really interesting. I enjoyed his tape perspective of the COVID situation. I was one of those that didn't think this was as serious as it's made out to be, but after listening to him, that's changed my attitude. So it's really, really a, a great guest to have on. The symbologist Michelle Snyder is back. I enjoyed her talk on the Bronze Age. And Brother Cronkite, really appreciate your warning not to eat the green beans. But you might also want to throw in there last year's leftover strawberries and ice cream. I'm sure that wouldn't be too healthy to eat this coming June. And in closing, I always have to pick on Larry. Uh, I think it was, I think it was Jack that asked Brian hit one of his most happy moments um, as a nurse. And of course, uh, Larry Maris, you had to pop in with your two cents and mention uh, the two times that you were in recovery. And Brian was was the nurse. That sounds more like a like a horror story and, and a sequel coming down the pike. So. Uh, Next time, Maris, keep your mouth shut. Nobody really cares. Anyway, guys, uh, looking forward to episode 112, and I'll be in touch. Bye. From the new recording lair located deep beneath the Wine and Spirit Store in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. You're listening to the Masonic Light Podcast. Studio 665 presents Masonic Light Podcast. This show is recorded by Masons, for Masons, and is for entertainment purposes only. And please, no wagering. This podcast is not endorsed by any Grand Lodge, and the ridiculous ramblings of the hosts are their own. And now, here's your host. Hey everybody, welcome to Masonic Light Podcast. Uh, this is Pete with your usual cast of characters. Hello, everyone. Hey. Hello. Um, Jack, we have a special guest. Uh, would you like to introduce our guest well, briefly, and then we'll get to our regular shenanigans? Well, okay. You're not going to tell I us what episode here, we're on? Because yeah. I'm confused. What episode I don't know what episode we're on. This is episode 113. 113? 113. 113. One hundred and thirteen. Is that the metric? Road system? to Phoenixville. Yeah. Nice. All right. So our our guest tonight is uh, Mark Stavish. Mark is a uh, a, a ridiculously prolific uh, author uh, on esoteric and occult topics. Thirty books. Um, Thirty. Um, yes, including some that haven't even been released yet. So, um, so we're going to talk to Mark. But first, we're going to go through our. Our ordinary opening, uh, which you have all come to love so well. Pete, what have you been up to recently, Masonically or golf-wise? Um, nothing Masonically, uh, but I went down to uh, Myrtle Beach with a guy who was my first line signer and uh, another brother, George Grove, who advertises with us. And, hey, we golf for four days, and uh, somehow we survived golf and the shenanigans afterwards and uh made it home so that's it for me nice how about tim tim what have you been up to well i had hoped to be up to a stated meeting last monday night but Uh snowstorm kind of stopped that from occurring uh but we did uh we were able to open and close the lodge and then have our two extra meetings where we uh, initiated four new brethren and raised one to a master mason degree, which was a lot of fun. Uh, nice. We got a new sponsor out of it. I'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, just all around good, uh, good week. 
cool. How about uh, how about Larry? You haven't been up to anything, have you, Larry? No, I haven't okay, been up to anything then, at all. Uh, let's move on to what, wait. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> move on. I'm not up to anything. Larry's here. Uh, no breakfast yet, Larry. No, no uh, goose yet. gridiron. We're looking at March. March. Okay. All right, Josh. How's things at the Masonic Center? Um, I'm not well. I mean, I guess they're all right. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. Did I did I mention the uh, the carpet at the Masonic Center yet? Oh no! <laughs> please do. Please do. I, I, okay. I, I think it was mentioned, but it wasn't detailed. Why don't you give us a little detail? So sure, they uh, they finished all the carpet in the uh, in the blue room at the Masonic Center and outside in the little uh, welcoming area and all through the museum. They, uh, they have all that carpet replaced, and they managed to actually put a checkered floor around the altar. Oh, fantastic. Whoa. Stolen so, from Ephrata, but we love you anyway. Right, right. So, Mark, uh, Mark's not familiar. Uh, Mark, they, uh, they, the Scottish Rite was rehearsing the Exodus degree, uh, and a pipe burst and flooded the entire Masonic Center in Lancaster. Um, so they had a huge recovery from that. Um, that's what he's talking about there. Oh, well, that's good to hear. I, I hope it didn't uh, set them back too much. <clears throat> <laughs> a couple of months. Yeah. Well, couple you know, months. with COVID, that's like, you know, consider that a win, right? Yeah, if you're going to be close to remodel, you might as well be closed for COVID at the same that's time. That's right. So for you guys, this was a good year. <laughs> so, Josh, did you start, uh, you didn't start degrees or anything yet, did you? No, we didn't. Um, okay. We're still still virtual. Um, we actually had our our, our Zoom meeting uh, last week, and uh, then I also had a, a, a master secretary meeting with the district this past weekend. So very good. Things are hopeful. Uh, I, I think we're we're still going to be closed for next month. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's what the word is. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's still, that's still virtual. That's kind of what I was told. Is I, I asked about my my mentoring classes, and they said uh, not to worry about it till probably April. So, right. Oh, by right. the way, by the way, in some jurisdictions, virtual is taboo. Stop it! Stop it! Stop! Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> Just stop it! We're going to cover that later. It's Chris Hodap's fault. Stop it! Stop, stop it! Up. Stop it, Larry! Stop it! <laughs> All right, Mark. What yeah. have you been up to, Masonic or esoterically speaking? Masonically, nothing. Uh, it's uh, the last year's been a, a total wash. Uh, presentations have been canceled. Uh, so you are really uh, my first, uh, what we would say, qualified Masonic event, really. Yeah, and we are very qualified. So, uh, <laughs> where are you in trouble? Uh, uh, I, I can hear from the, the <laughs> <laughs> from the ice in the glasses. I can hear. It's, what? I, I hear no ice. What are no, you talking no. about? That's uh, yeah. So it's been busy, but of course, uh, I think in the meantime, since we started the program, I'm probably up to 32 books in the pipeline now. <laughs> 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 You know, and uh, of course, trying to remind myself that Zoom meetings do have cameras. You know, and that, uh, which is which is why we use ZenCaster. So there's no cameras here. We can. You know. It's appreciated. You know, I I almost put my uh, my pajama bottoms on before sitting down. I thought, you know. Okay, TMI, brother. TMI. Uh, you, you, you can't see Jack opening his third eye with a uh, rub and coke. <laughs> With a fork, you say? With a fork. <laughs> oh. oh. All right. Well, I'm, and I guess I'm last. Um, I have done nothing Masonically in the last, other than my uh, book club. I started a, uh, a book discussion group that I mentioned on the last show. Um, and our first, uh, our first episode went fairly well. We, uh, we read The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And uh, had a good response and a good discussion, and um, we're uh, we're moving forward with that. So, uh, if you're interested, it's called the Agora, a Masonic book discussion on Facebook. Um, you're welcome to um, apply for uh, a slot, but um, it, it, if you're going to participate, please do. If you're not going to participate, um, don't uh, don't bother joining because you'll get called out if if you're not a part of the group uh, and participating. But not not to not to be you know snarky about it, but 
Um, we just would like people who are involved to be involved. So no lurkers. So uh, I really did do something Masonic this past week. Oh. You read a book, Larry. Oh, and yeah. I was on the, I was on the meeting Zoom. Meeting. You were, and you contributed even. Ah. Look at that. Whoa. Uh, what what, what was your thoughts on the on the on the just just the generality of it, just the the fact that it happened and the conversation that happened structure wise? Was right. you had a good time? I think we had a great uh, great uh, meeting, and I, I think we had a lot of. Uh, a lot of viewpoints on the book and it made me change my mind about it because I hated the book actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Gotta love a book club where you hate the book. The point was, was, was pretty, pretty good and of course I did go back and read over it and I saw some of the things. Uh, but no, I thought it was really well done and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. All right, Larry, so much. Larry ruined it for everyone when he says uh, Snape kills Dumbledore like right in the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> So, so Mark, uh, of the uh, 300 books that you've written since the show started, um, if, if there were a book that a, a broad spectrum of readers should look at from a, from a Masonic perspective out of your portfolio, what, what do you think would be a good, um, a good book that we should recommend for the group? Well, that would be... Uh my book freemasonry rituals and symbols rituals symbols and history of the secret society uh that was originally published by llewellyn in 2007 i believe and it's in uh french spanish portuguese okay estonian. we're gonna read it in estonian, portuguese larry estonian, you know i think it's, i'm proud that's an estonian you know really that's my favorite one you know, milani is like, a fan milani is like a big 500 fan. copies of it out there and I, I love that one but do you uh, have it in pennsylvania dutch though uh, working on that, we do. We do have a German copy of uh, my other book on egregores that came out. So, okay. but we, I, I think that um, for the broad-based audience, this book is the best. Inner Traditions is going to be re-releasing it in October with an introduction by Art de Hoyas. And um, the reason I suggest the book is because not only does it give a broad introduction to Freemasonry and the degrees, but it puts them in a historical context, which many. Uh, of the brethren simply don't grasp. And uh, as we know, Masonic education can be a very tricky subject, uh, often consisting solely and exclusively of ritual memorization and uh, very rarely of anything else. And, of course, we're seeing efforts to change that. We're seeing a lot of tremendous. Uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, has two traditional observance lodges, uh, which uh, are uh, one of them in your area, of course, in fact. And, and this notion of Masonic education, I think, is very important. But not only that, but the book places Masonry in a broader social and historical context with actual, I, I don't want to say lessons, but assignments, really. I mean, how do we understand the culture of Masonry, particularly, we'll say, old Masonry from the 18th century, 19th century, unless we in some way can begin to put ourselves in that mindset and uh, so there are different ways of uh, things to do and ways of thinking about things and, so when you're when, when you're saying that it's in a historical aspect you're saying that it's chronological not like ancient mysteries egypt to mesopotamia to blah 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 blah, blah. but but more um more what we would call modern history grandma jera and later well so slightly before that we start at the the rule it's really the end of the renaissance Okay. Because that's what gives rise to the, uh, and of course at the time, you know, when I wrote the book, 1717 was the uh, the agreed upon year for the uh, Grand Lodge. And I know they've been pushing that, that date around since then with some new documentation, but I'm, I'm not too concerned about that. Um, the whole point is lodges existed prior to the Grand Lodge. What were those lodges like? Why did they exist? Who was in them? And we need to, we need to tie Freemasonry into that earlier period both scientifically but also philosophically and religiously you know why is it that masonry was so important then sure uh, what made it unique in terms of the social uh conditions of the time and then moving forward and then how masonry becomes a uh a recruiting ground and a model for other esoteric movements particularly in the 18th and 19th century we can talk about that but it really is mostly focusing around blue lodge and those three degrees and then does look at Royal Arch and, of course, uh, York Rite and, and Scottish Rite degrees. Cool. All right. So let's, uh, let's take a quick break, and uh, we will come back with a lot more from Mark Stavish. Mark 
why choose George J. Grove & Sons for your next home improvement project? At George J. Grove & Sons, we've built our reputation on quality and trust for more than 50 years. For planning to materials to installation, George J. Grove promises a home improvement experience second to none. Whether your goal is reducing energy costs, decreasing maintenance, updating curb appeal, or simply increasing the value of your home, the George J. Grove team will recommend and provide solutions that stand the test of time. Call 717-393-0859 for an estimate or visit us at georgejgrove.com. We're back. This is Tim. Um, before we get back to our interview, we want to acknowledge uh, those who support our podcast on Patreon. Uh, and for as little as one dollar a month, one damn dollar, just, just a dollar, just a dollar for a dollar. You can keep quality content like this going. Uh, go to patreon.com slash Masonic Light Podcast, uh, and you can join the dozens of people uh, that uh, have contributed to this show. And our newest Patreon supporter is Rick Kellinger, uh, a bur the brand new Master Mason from Eureka West Shore Lodge, who uh, we're working on maybe having him on as a guest, as a, as a new Mason. Um, he talked about how our podcast has been significant, I will say, in his Masonic journey of waiting out the COVID uh, virus. So, uh, oh, oh Lord, we're going to have to. Yeah, I've actually heard. I've he heard a couple of guys say that. Yes, he dropped. He dropped uh, some money our way and said thanks a lot, and so we appreciate that support. Uh, we'd love to have some more people like Rick out there. Fantastic, thank you, brother Rick. All right, so we're coming back with um, with Brother Mark Stavish. Um, Mark, uh, just looking through your your curriculum vitae, as they say, um, the first thing that comes up is the Institute for Hermetic Studies. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, how that how that got started, how you came to be involved in it, and um, what it means in your sort of cosmology. Well, it, it started uh, in 1998, and it really started as a local study group. I had folks asking me to put together a, a study group where they could get together twice a month and go over different aspects of esotericism, theoretical and practical, you know, Kabbalah, alchemy, uh, astrology, uh, Rosicrucianism, classical theurgy, you know, esoteric masonry, that those kinds of things. And... Uh, we had a lot of folks coming from New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, D.C. area. So uh, it, it really dwarfed my, my initial expectations. And as things got formalized, and uh, we just said, okay, we've got to change this beyond its local nature. And we gave it a name. And over time, it just took off. We, uh, For the longest time, we had uh, even a Masonic Reading Society as a sidebar. And uh, we would meet regularly once a month to, to discuss some Masonic text. Uh, that eventually uh, fell along the wayside. But before that happened, we were able to have several authors of merit uh, come and present, uh, one of which was James Wasserman, who uh, recently uh, passed away in November. And his books on Knights Templar and uh, Templarism are, are well known to uh, many of the brethren. And in fact, uh, two or three of his books uh, we are mentioned in because it was his presentation at uh, our society that became the impetus for his, his writing on those topics for the publication. So we've done a lot of seminars, workshops over the years, decades with people, and uh, eventually a lot of that was organized and put together. And within the last year, uh, we, we formally put together uh, our study program uh, through Teachable, which people can uh, subscribe to and just go sign up for different classes. And, and on top of that, of course, there's the, you know, all the, the printed material, but it's to give people access to 
esoteric ideas in, a, in both a, a classical and a modern format at their own pace, rather than having to uh, join a specific order or group and uh, sometimes find that things are doled out, you know, in spoonfuls over the years rather than maybe as, as easily or more quickly than they could be. Especially in the Blue Lodge, because m- most of the Blue Lodges really don't even begin to touch on that aspect. Um, I know I know, mine didn't when I joined. Um, there was just nothing there. It, it, it's amazing how it's grown in the last 12 years, how, how much more knowledge, how much more access to information, I guess it is. is the, the knowledge is still there or has always been there, but the access to it is so much greater now. Well, I think we have several phenomena taking place there. Um, one is that, you know, we, we have the Da Vinci Code, which is now 15 years old, but but that created an explosive interest in Freemasonry, which most of the lodges and grand lodges, you know, they, they, they burned that opportunity. They burned that in the ground. <laughs> Shocking, I know. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, the the shopping, the shocking failure to take advantage of an opportunity by Grand Lodge officers once again. Uh, so uh, that you know, what you had though is that the wave though could not be ducked. The wave right. could not be the genie could not be put back in the bottle. So you have a tremendous amount of younger men uh, joining the fraternity, uh, just as we're waiting for the cataclysmic die-off of the older members, particularly. In, jurisdictions like pennsylvania and uh you know many of those young men uh god bless them for the courage they had you know stuck it out regardless of the insufferable prejudices of too many of the blue lodge members when it came to discussing anything beyond you know chicken dinners and and ritual memorization so as that gets pushed through over time what we've seen now is a lot of these younger members simply saying you know what, Grand, you know, Masonic lodges are really interesting places because in reality, we have a tremendous amount of freedom in what we can do. We really do. And so many of them... You mean within each lodge, right? Yes, within each yeah. lodge. So a lot, of these, a lot of these guys realize, you know, we, we can pretty much do a lot here uh, as long as we don't, you know, try to... Uh, change the bylaws or anything or, or do anything really outrageous so uh many of them have stuck to it and and, and met with other young men uh you know young being relative but uh and and, and and formed you know as we said traditional observance lodges and petitioned for that and and of course as now we move forward the technology has now become the forefront the mechanism of meeting other masons and i think that when we look back at 2020 and 2021 we're going to see uh, two things will have occurred. One is that it was a catastrophic year for masonry as a whole, uh, particularly because of attendance at lodges and and people beginning to rethink their membership. I mean, they're saying, well, I haven't been at lodge in all year, and so do I really need to be a member? Um, and that is going to happen. You're going to see lodges lose members and some of them fold even. On the other hand, you're going to see that it was a banner year for Freemasonry right. as Masons use technology like this to keep things moving forward. So in a sense, this has presented a tremendous opportunity for a much needed forward motion or shift in Masonic orientation and moving into that notion of education. Mark, because- uh, this is... Hey, Mark, I apologize. This is Pete. Uh, I joined the lodge in 97, and the impression that I got then, all of the active members had joined between 1950 and 1996 pretty much to hang out with their buddies, you know, after after the wars. And there's, you know, a 40, 50-year period there, I guess, of lost knowledge because I felt like those men – never picked up that esoteric stuff to pass on to us. So now we're kind of researching it on our own from guys like you. Is, is well, that I, something I, you've noticed? I, well, I think there's a real problem there is because if you look at the writings 
as early as, you know, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania was, I think, the second or third Grand Lodge founded. So that would have been, I'm just going to throw a number out here, something like 1735 or 40. Okay. So this is like 30 years after the founding of the United Grand Lodge of England, right? The first one. And at that time, there was a complaint about the degrading of the Masonic degree. Okay, I, want that to, I want that to be context. Right. Now, at the same time, dues in a lodge would have been roughly a week's or two weeks' salary. Right. Now, okay, so we move forward. There's a variety of lodges, a variety of degrees, particularly Scottish right, explodes across Europe. And you have a host of degrees and rights that come and go like the wind, some of which are very significant, like the El Cohen, which morphs into Martinism different Rose Croix degrees. But at the same time, you see, as this moves forward, we have the anti-Masonic period in the United States, which did tremendous damage. We see the revival of Masonry in many ways with uh, Scottish Rite with Albert Pike, who was tremendously erudite and educated with the materials of that time. He was a, a true scholar of esotericism. Of, with, with using what he had available to him at that time. And we see that a lot of that was ignored. So even as when you look at the literature from 1910, 1920, even then there is a discussion of, you know, how has masonry become just this club? And wh where, where did it lose connection? So there's, that's been a perennial question, really. I want that to be clear, this notion and of esotericism in it. Where is it? It's always been there. Uh, yet at the same time, it always seems to get missed as you try to make the organization bigger. And after the revolution, or the, the Civil War, you see these massive parades of Knight Templar. And I mm -hmm. see photographs of when there's thousands of these guys. Okay. And they're wearing uniforms that look like the Grand Army of the Republic. Okay. So as masonry in the United States, and that has to be understood within the American framework, the American experience, not the European one, okay, uh, at least not the continental one. Our experience is still similar in some ways to the, to at least the, the, the British one. Uh, it's always been along these kind of social lines, and it, there's always been a, a, an ignoring of the esoteric. So, I, I suspect if you could really drill down and do the numbers, I suspect that the number of people that were interested in the esoteric aspect remained fairly well constant, but the total volume of people just swamped them. And that's when it became a bowling league. Uh, they, they just, those people were still there and they were still writing and the lead betters and the Haywoods and those guys right. were still, were still present. But, but they, their voices just couldn't be heard over the over the throng of of the the social fraternity. Well, well that's correct, and and unfortunately, what happened in many jurisdictions is what happened. Like, I mean, I'll speak for northeastern Pennsylvania locally. Uh, as you as you opened up the doors widely, you know, we no longer guarded the western gate. Um, as you get these massive numbers in a lot of the people who are able to keep the machinery running, um, they say, what am I doing here? I, 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 I don't need this. This is a waste of my time. So they often leave. So what we see in a lot of lodges is, at least around here, is well-intended men who do not have the skill set to run an organization, and they don't know it. And that's the other part. They don't know it. So the lodges end up on a death spiral because when then when young and I've heard about this from other jurisdictions, too, from people, young, young men telling me this. So then you get these guys who join and they want to study and learn something and, and they get looked at like, you know, like what? You know, you're not here for the chicken dinner or the pancakes. And, and the idea is, no, I, I'm here to learn about the mysteries. What are the mysteries? What do you mean? And, and yet at the same time, you and I and everyone else listening to this knows that there are many things listed in those wonderful Blue Lodge rituals that are fantastic mm -hmm. you know they're just spectacular and then you go into scottish Rite, and the information there is spectacular and and uh and the old ritual booklets that i've seen would actually have a discussion of what the symbolism and numerology means in kabbalah and alchemy and but of course northern jurisdiction keeps re-editing these rituals and, and waters them down into uh, something 
less and less meaningful. Fortunately, Southern Jurisdiction, uh, Southern Jurisdiction really has all the brains. They really do. Okay, send those letters to Mark Stavish. He'll be at the Institute. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the honest discussion. <laughs> now, the beautiful uh, thing is, again, now the beautiful thing is, young men have noticed this. Right. And they've they've used technology to meet up with one another, to form study groups, to form discussion groups like you're talking about, to start things. And that's going to be the great movement forward, along with the most spectacular educational program that the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania has. And that needs to be really stated and clearly made available to the members that uh, the education program, the, uh, the Master Mason, cert- the, the, or the Master Builders Mas- Award, the Masonic, yeah. the Mon- Masonic Scholar Certification Program. Ah, okay, yeah. These are these are top notch. And and what I have told many young men in Pennsylvania who come to me, I said that coupled with the Academy Masonic Academy, these are they're just tops. I, yeah, we're we're very blessed to be here in Pennsylvania and have yeah. all those resources for us. So, so um, to to that respect, let let's suppose that a new young man, and by young I mean younger than me, which is you know middle aged. Well, we'll say um, anyone under fifty. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, but yeah, that works. Um, so they they come in, they're looking for that that spiritual aspect that that esoteric you know deeper meaning that kind of thing where would you suggest they start how does how does the new guy start to plumb that where should he go that, first yeah and that's the beauty of it you see within what in, within that really fairly depressive scenario i just described there are tremendous lights and as I tell all the, the new young men coming in who want this stuff, I said, this is perfect. You're in at the right time. I agree. Because you go to the Pennsylvania Academy, you meet these guys there and these presenters and these people and the brethren there, and you make connections there. You take part in the Masonic Scholar Program, and you meet these folks. And suddenly, all of the problems, and I have to say this truthfully, all of those problems that you were having with Blue Lodge and whatever was going they just fade away. They, look, you suddenly realize masonry is a big tent. And that if you're, if you're patient and you're resourceful, you will find in that tent like minds, like members, who you can have a really wonderful fraternal relationship with uh, without having to get caught up in, you know, many many things of the large politics and and at the same time those large politics we have to look at them in a way at least i do this is because i'm not involved in them is for those members who are involved that is their expression of involvement and that keeps the machinery running hmm. whereas you know if we just focus only on these wonderful intellectual or spiritual aspects we run the risk of ignoring the machinery so we have to find a balance any- point Pete, any comment on that? Well, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, on one of the things that bothers me from being involved, you know, I started out out of college working in the go- a government agency, and I saw things run very poorly. Um, and then I've been with some successful companies, and I saw how w- what I see lacking, and you kind of mentioned it when the Grand Lodge just missed that opportunity around the Da Vinci Code. Um yeah, it's one of the things I, I really enjoy about the Scottish Rite right now. I actually see a team that is trying to run it like a business and to try and capitalize on on opportunities when they come around. Um, and I, I just keep think, wish that the Blue Lodges and, for God's sake, especially the York Rite, if they could just find somebody who knew how to operate a business. You know, there's so much good stuff in York Rite. But nobody's going to go find it because they can't just tolerate the the bureaucracy. You know, I have to say, York Rite. My, when I went through that, the man those those rituals, the ritual experience of going through that was spectacular. It was just spectacular, and uh, you know, it's those moments. You know, whether it's the part part of your first degree or part of your third degree. Uh, you know, or, or other, you know, those parts of those other degrees, you remember them. And that's what initiation is about. It's about that kind of memory and experience that 
shifts your perspective, even if you can't articulate it. You know something special is happening, and it stays with you and allows you to uh, have some focus and resourcefulness to continue your journey. And it's important that as young men have those experiences is that they, they have access to other men within the fraternity uh, to help guide them along those lines. And, uh, you know, that's where shows like this are important. But it has to also go beyond the show. It has to be within uh, the, the sitting room, uh, outside of the temple, outside of the, the lodge room, you know, in lodge where you're sitting with other fellows uh, and, and brethren and, and talking about these things. And maybe not everybody in the lodge has to have an interest. No, they don't. But the core that does, the small group that does, has to be allowed to voice itself without concern of censure or ridicule. And I have found that that is not always the case, at least locally, when, when we would do things. That uh, too many of the old guard, and, and let me state at the and here you can send the, the letters to me. <laughs> One of the problems that we have in masonry is as it attempt it has always attempted to follow a map, a large American masonry has always attempted to do things on a large scale. And as you saw the Masonic Brotherhood form a significant role in the American Revolution and a significant role in you know, the uh, healing after the Civil War. Uh, you also see the Masonic uh, bodies, of course, playing certain roles, you know, both during the first and second, after the Second World War. But the problem there is that American masonry, at least, Pencil at least Pennsylvania masonry, uh, does not understand that it, it is not a uh, veterans organization. It is an organization with veterans. Right. And when you look at the Masonic magazine and you see all this stuff aimed at veterans uh, or recruiting, going for more members, what we're doing is we are going for members who are more like us. Rather than saying, who are who can join masonry who would we like to see in masonry that has skills beyond that and i have to say i mean this is again this is uh, when you have a, you need people in the fraternity on the blue lodge level who know how to run organizations and businesses you need that and we don't have that as a whole we miss it we're missing out on a lot of that and that's that's where some of our problems come from we have very good workers we have very good volunteers when we have them. They're spectacular. But we need more than that. We need vision. We need visionary people as well. We're missing parts of the pyramid, if you will. Parts of the temple are missing. We need more. Interesting. All right. Let's 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 uh, let's take a quick break and uh, refresh our, our brains because uh, that, that's a lot to take in. So um, let's take a quick break. We'll listen to a message from uh, one of our uh, supporters, and then we'll be back in a moment with more Mark Stavish. As far back as the mid-1800s, records exist describing the pre-meaning tradition of brethren smoking cigars during and after gatherings. To this day, the practice of smoking cigars remains very much alive in many lodges. This custom is considered a time for brethren to relax, exchange ideas, and enjoy the simplicity and fellowship that is the very essence of our brotherhood. This is what Hireman Solomon Cigars is all about. Our starting principles are to bring Masonic brethren together in the harmony of a good cigar. Pull up a chair, sit back, Light up any of our premium cigars and enjoy the history. Hiram and Solomon Cigars can be found at fine cigar retailers. For a complete list, visit HiramandSolomonCigars.com or check them out on social media to find out when they'll be at a live event near you. Hiram and Solomon Cigars is pleased to be the official cigar of the Masonic Light Podcast.
And we're back with Mark Stavish. And Mark, um, one of the one of the reasons we or I wanted to reach out to you was um, I've been following you on Facebook, and uh, among among things within Freemasonry, um, you can't you can't open a book about the deeper meaning of Freemasonry without finding references uh, from from. From Pike onward, Pike, Ledbetter, Haywood, all, all those guys, all those old authors are all talking about things like Kabbalah and theosophy and, and various uh, aspects of spirituality that, um, that for the most part, um, doesn't, that conversation doesn't happen in Blue Lodge. So what was it that drew you to that aspect? Because I know just based on your book list, uh, you are a you are a deep sea diver in in that sort of occult and esoteric information. So, what drew you to that, and where do you see that fitting into the future of Freemasonry? Well, again, what's wonderful about Masonry is being the big tent that it is, and that each member is free to understand Masonic ritual and symbols according to the best of their ability. Uh, so, there are some wonderful uh, books out there, and of course, I encourage the readers to get a hold of my book. You know, Freemasonry, Ritual, Symbols, and Histories of the Secret Society, because not only does that give them an overview and, but, and things to do, ways of understanding these lessons, but there's also a very comprehensive uh, reading list for each chapter. So they're not going to have to wonder, what do I read next? It's, it's going to be clearly laid out for them. I know several lodges have used it as a, as a curriculum, and, and some have even, uh, folks have written to me and saying how they give copies of it to uh, you know, their incoming members or, or, or whoever is going to serve as master for that year. So I, I really do encourage it. It is widely read. It's uh, in Brazil, uh, in Portuguese, and in France. Uh, in, it's in Spanish as well. And I think I even mentioned to you in, in Estonian and Russian. But And the reason I say that is that's because those are areas, particularly Brazil and Portuguese, uh, that in, uh, where they have a tremendous amount of interest in esotericism. Uh, again, going back to the early discussion of the continental masonry, you know, the French have a tremendous rich history of esotericism, French esotericism. So to be in those languages is really uh, a pointer as to what quality uh, of a, a production that book is and, and why it's of value. And I said, so for this reason, I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but it really is a good book. Uh, that is a <laughs> great, you know, I mean, it's a great place to start. That being said, get involved with the Masonic Academy. Get involved you know, with uh, the Scholars Program. <laughs> They're incredibly useful. You'll meet other men and be able to use those books and find out what others are reading because the role of uh, masonry as a focal point is where many people come together. They constantly see Freemasonry being mentioned as, you know, all these members of the Golden Dawn, they were Freemasons. What is Masonry's connection to Rosicrucianism, if any? Uh, what about Freemasonry and Martinism, or the Elo Kohane, which you mentioned earlier, the magical masonry group of the 18th century? All of this gets interconnected and interweaved in and through Freemasonry and Blue Lodge at some point. Is, is, that, is that a real affiliation, or is that, a, is that an overlaid perception? It's a real affiliation in the sense that it existed. It is an overlaid perception in that people think that it was always official. It wasn't. Freemasonry was a recruiting ground in many ways. It wasn't at, uh, essentially, you know, you hear these conspiracy theorists, you know, you always hear them. And, and I rarely use that phrase because I can tell you about real conspiracies. <laughs> but, you know, there, there are some which are really just nonsense. And and we, we all hear a lot of the most of the nonsense ones in all Freemasonry, right? Uh, they'll tell you how well you don't really know what's going on. You know, it's in the it's up in the higher degrees, right? And say, well, we've been through that. Well, you still don't know what's going on. It's it's in you know in the the secret cavern where the lizard people meet in Grand Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I only Wait, you wish haven't it been to that, that room, way. have you? Oh my I, gosh! I, I wish it were that way. I'd pay my due <laughs> time if it were that way. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, that'd be great. You know? <laughs> So um, I'm just looking right now at your at your Amazon uh, prof profile, um, okay. and if anybody's interested in what Mark is all about, just go to Amazon.com and search for Mark Stavish, and uh, it Egregory's uh, Alchemy, Kabbalah, 
um, theory and practice of Enochian magic, the liturgy of Hermes. Uh, I'm just, I'm just click one click is getting me to these titles, child of the sun, um, Mercury's children, shamanic knowledge, um, magical almond. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it is a, it is a really deep dive. Yeah. Um, yeah. and if, if, it, I, I, mean, I think what's good here is if someone wants to say, what is hermeticism? That's where they're going to say, you know, I've heard this word before. I've heard it in some of the rituals. I don't really understand it. You know, then they go and they can get our monograph, Introduction to Hermeticism, It's Theory and Practice. It's like nine bucks, eight ninety five on Amazon. And that'll give them an overview of it. You know, and they'll, they'll have an idea and they'll have some other reading materials listed in there to go forward. Again, within the book Freemasonry, there's reading material to go forward, and and they'll begin to see where these different ideas dovetail. You know, there's different aspects of Kabbalah, which is fundamentally Jewish mysticism that became somewhat Christianized in some schools, and then what we'll call Hermeticized, meaning Christian and earlier classical paganism became layered on top of it during the Renaissance and continue to move forward. And you'll begin to see why these ideas are important to us, you know. Because when you come across it in, 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 say, Scottish Rite, you know, at least in the northern jurisdiction, you hear the words, but there's no explanation. But again, as I said, northern jurisdiction. So members should, and it is the best buy in Freemasonry, as Art DeHoya says, I mean, join southern jurisdiction. <laughs> I mean, for the, the few dollars you pay each year and the tremendous quality of publications they produce uh, – Quality and quantity, uh, that, that's your best, some of your best buys in Freemasonry. It's, it's a great organization. So I'm telling you, read my stuff because I, I wrote it and it's good. And <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Move outward from there and, 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 and join these three basic Masonic groups we've told you about. I'll say them again. Southern Jurisdiction, uh, the, Maso- the Maso- Academy of Masonic Knowledge, you know, the Masonic Scholars Program. These are just you'll meet so many great people. This won't even be a question anymore for you of where to go. It'll be, where do I stop? <laughs> There's so much. Where do I, well, stop? that's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm layered in deep I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm like a mile wide and six inches deep, right? Like a, a lot of people are, I think uh, I know a little bit about a lot of this stuff. Um, but I don't go, I don't go into that deep, um, study of it. Um, I'm, I'm sort of chipping away at it, but I, I still have a long way to go on a lot of that stuff, but, um, I really just like to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but, uh, um, and, and, and that kind of gets, I've, I, I jotted down a couple of quick questions. So Rosicrucians, Martinists and Theosophists. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we all just commentaries on the same thing from a different perspective? In some ways, yes. <clears throat> in some ways, yes. I mean, theosophy, um, you know, with a small T or a capital T, depending on whether you're talking Blavatsky and as in modern Blavatsky's theosophy, or whether you're talking theosophy such as uh, Jacob Buma and uh, the, that type of theosophy is uh, is different. Uh, same, they're all asking questions about who am I? Where have I come from? Where am I going? These are existential questions. Right. And and masonry, in its ritual work, attempts to help us to ask and address that ritual question. And in fact, uh, I give a presentation on the um, Chamber of Reflection. And the Chamber of Reflection was generally the first thing you would encounter in Freemasonry before you received your first or entered apprentice degree. That no longer happens in this jurisdiction. Uh, it you do experience it in some of the uh, York Rite degrees, and it's a wonderful experience. And of course, Scottish Rite maintains it. Now, th- when I give this presentation, I say the Chamber of Reflection really, in essence, asks you one question: Why are you here? That's really what it does. Why are you here? Yeah. Oh, I thought for a minute you were looking for an answer. All right, so, sorry. <laughs> and, and, and that's a question each of us has to answer for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, and that was asked at a time, and I, I say, that, you now they don't ask you that question in the chamber, but that's really what it's saying in many ways, mm-hmm. is um, 
you would have to reflect on your Masonic membership. Why are you appearing for membership? And at a time when, uh, you know, your answer would be read in the open body of the lodge and in some rites they would burn it, you know, other times they wouldn't. But it was at a time when being a Freemason was a threat to life and liberty. So you had to have a real serious reason to want to join that group other than, you know, the chicken dinners and the pancake breakfast. You know, there was something serious going on here. Were they, were they doing pancakes back then? Yeah, I, I don't think Cagliastro was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would have eaten his pancakes anyway, but that's another. No, that's Broly's cookies. Uh, his, uh, see, Cagliastro's pancakes were fine. But okay. yeah, and, and he was the last, uh, is reported to have been the last uh, prisoner to die in the prisons of the Inquisition. And of course, one of the, one of the charges was that free so we have to understand that our, our, our organization and our membership in it uh, has to have a deep meaning beyond what we have traditionally given in the last hundred years. And, you know, there's three legs to the Masonic experience. That is uh, fraternity, charity, and uh, philosophy. We need to make sure we keep the philosophy there because that's what made it dangerous, not the charity or the fraternity. Self study, right. learning how to exercise a freedom of intellect and a freedom of mind, and that's what the existential questions of Theosophy and Kabbalah are. Who am I as a person? What is my place in this cosmos? What other beings are in this cosmos? You know, and and how do we relate to one another? What is our relationship to all these vast things? And then, what does that mean to me as a person as I grow? You know, and, and experience more and more of my potentiality. Fantastic stuff. Awesome. Um, so, guys, uh, anybody else have any questions for Mark that um, you'd like to get in before we move to close here? No. Larry, you still awake? You yes, us? I am. Okay. All right. Just checking. All right. Um, well, fantastic, uh, Mark. You've been a, you've been great. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. I, I would um, I would love to turn around and have you back uh, some sometime, uh, and uh, maybe take a specific dive somewhere. Um, I think. But uh, thank you for joining us. Um, stick around if you like. Uh, you're welcome to bail out. But uh, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, then we'll come back and go around the horn to close and. Uh, have Larry talk to his chickens. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and, and uh, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you for having me. At the historic Smithton Inn of Ephrata, Pennsylvania, we're pleased to serve the latest creations from Weathered Vineyard Winery, along with spirits from Thistle Finch Distillery in Lancaster, all to be experienced in the tasting room of a beautifully restored 18th century bed and breakfast. Cigars by DNS Cigar are available for your enjoyment in the courtyard. The historic Smithton Inn is convenient to Lancaster County's most interesting attractions. Just minutes from the Ephrata Cloister and the Green Dragon Farmer's Market, and a short drive can get you to charming Lidditz, thriving downtown Lancaster, as well as Hershey, Bird in Hand, and Intercourse, or Valley Forge and Gettysburg. Whether you're looking for a romantic getaway or an active vacation full of sightseeing and attractions, the historic Smithton Inn will be a welcoming oasis from everyday life, one that you'll want to visit again and again. Stop in and visit at 900 West Main Street in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, or check out our website at historicsmithtoninn.com, or simply call us at 717-733-6094. Just ask for Past Master Dave. Unlocking Symbols with Symbologist Michelle Snyder. The Green Man Unlocked. Today, our golden key will unlock the secret of the mysterious face in the leaves, the green man. Perhaps you know someone with the proverbial green thumb. It seems every plant they touch thrives. Those who can grow food are important to the survival of humanity. 
This colorful character began with the 20,000 BC creation myth of Aski and Emla, the original Adam and Eve who were named after the ash and elm trees. Over time, faces with leaves and vines around them were used to express the concept of vegetation, creation, cycles of nature, and those who made things grow. The name Green Man was not used until the 1900s. Older names for this symbolic character are Jacko the Green, Pan, Robin Goodfellow, Puck, and Bacchus. During the warm centuries around 4500 BC, women with green thumbs cultivated kitchen gardens in, now, in what is now Germany. At the same time, the cattle herding Celts migrated south, following food and crops, eventually merging with the women's agricultural way of life. The green man image symbolized these herders turned farmers. There were even some green girls, although they are less common. The leafy face symbol is central to the cultures of pre-Christian Europe. Many beautiful European gardens have a likeness of this ancient farmer watching over their gardens, ensuring lush and beautiful vegetation. The green man is still used today as a decorative motif in the British Isles and Europe, appearing in many public buildings and even chapels. A carving in the Exeter Cathedral from 1309 depicts a Madonna and child standing on the head of a green man, perhaps symbolizing the ancient farmers who supported the women and children with their crops. The symbol of the face and the leaves has come to represent irrepressible life, animal fertility, the hope of new crops, and renaissance or rebirth in the sense that the vegetation is reborn each spring. This symbol prompts us to think about the relationship humanity has with the plant kingdom the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide necessary for life. The green face represents a watcher observing the cycles of birth, death, and resurrection of our most critical natural resources. Our dependency upon the plant kingdom is part of the message. The green man blesses new growth and brings beauty to our environment while reminding us of our part in the process of gardening. There are more modern examples of the Green Man image, such as the Green Man vegetable logo, even Peter Pan and the Hulk. For more symbols unlocked, read Symbology Revision by Michelle Snyder. In our next episode, there'll be dragons about. If you'd like to take a deeper look, be sure to check out Michelle's book, Symbology Revision. A link for purchase can be found on the Freea Foundation website. That's freafoundation.net. While you're there, take a look at some of Michelle's other works and find out more about the Freea Foundation and its mission to research and publish the Ensman archives. In Masonic News Today, this week, popular Masonic blogger lit up the internet when an article was posted discussing the suspension of who had served as for the Grand Lodge of we were told that he had a meeting of where no was which violated a of the current most masons feel there is more to this story but the masons of sure can keep a secret that's the masonic news so mode it was <laughs> oh yeah well that is definitely current events uh, there uh, brother uh, concrete that is current events like you've never heard before and you heard it here first. That's right. Wow. Uh, so, uh, Josh, what do you have coming up in the next uh, week or so in the Masonically related? Uh, not really too much. Just trying to keep uh, Lamberton Lodge number 476 trucking along. Uh, just got some, you know, 
some some initiatives we're trying to do behind the scenes with contacting people and all that. Um, wrapping up our our audit for the year, um, you know, just the normal normal for, for the year twenty nineteen stuff. Or what? Uh, 2016, I think it was. <laughs> Larry, are you doing anything? That's not funny. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Larry, are you doing anything? Am I doing anything? No, uh, no, 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 no. Tim, what do you have going on there in uh, wherever you're from? <laughs> oh, over on this side of the river. Um, we've got a couple rehearsals. Uh, we're still planning on the District 3 Oyster Feed will be uh, held at uh, Eureka Westshore Lodge on March the 1st. Uh, you can check our website out uh, for details on that. Space is limited. Uh, I believe we are allowing maybe 45 or 50 folks total uh, with appropriate distancing and so on. So, you can check out those details online. Are these um, the local Susquehanna oysters? Uh, yeah, no. No, we've actually got, uh, there's a guy. I, we've got this guy that uh, has provided us oysters for some time. He, he brings them in. They're really good. Uh, and we usually have a large turnout for that. And so, but we're not expecting a, a huge turnout because folks are still not coming. We, we, I mentioned the extra meeting that we had. We had we actually had 25 people show up to an extra meeting. Wow. Which was amazing. Uh, I, I, people are starved for Freemasonry. Yeah. They really are. I, I yeah. believe it. Yep. So other than that, uh, just some trainings going on, as Josh mentioned. A lot of lodges uh, needing help with their audits. Um, that's, that's about it. Jack, what do you have happening? Well, uh, at Effort of Lodge, we're going to have the corn squid dinner. Uh, <laughs> corn <what>? squid? <laughs> it's a Gap Lighthouse thing. Never mind. There you go. Okay. Uh, so no, we're uh, we're still uh, we're still locked until I believe April. Uh, so we'll have our first meeting in April. And uh, I really, it's great. I'm, I'm getting phone calls from the candidates that I'm mentoring. Like, hey, you got a minute to talk? I read something really cool, and I want to run it by you. So that's great. I just love that. Um, they're 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 excited. They're still connected, and um, I hope that when we uh, when we can finally get get going again on degrees, that uh, that we can help them find um, that which was lost. So that's it for uh, me. Mark, do you have any uh, thing coming up? Uh, any any speaking engagements or anything? Or are you still locked down as well? Well, Masonically, I, everything that I was scheduled to do has been canceled or put on hold. Uh, so I don't have anything coming up. The, the only thing we're doing is we're preparing for the, the Institute's annual conference uh, first weekend in May for Saturday in May. And, and that's going to be done virtually. Uh, so that's, that's really the main focus. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the Masonic stuff is it's all vaporized. Wow. Except for this. And, and again, uh, that's why I say you guys are great. And, and all those guys listening, just take full advantage of this opportunity and the technology and these shows to – to make these connections that when you come back together, when we're able to sit in rooms together again, uh, we have all this to add some vitality and juice to the, uh, to the experience. Awesome. Um, what do I have going on? Well, um, as secretary, as scribe for Lancaster forest, I'm just trying to, I have the defibrillator out and I'm just, you know, trying to keep it alive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, as what uh, Pennsylvania Grotto Association president, I'm getting ready for our uh, spring meeting that's going to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, April 23rd, 24th, 25th. Uh, you can come out on the 24th and receive the Pennsylvania Dutch Farm degree. It's going to be ridiculous. Um, and I guess Jack and I also have uh, the. It's not. It's not a constitution. It's a consecration. <laughs> it's something we're chartering of. Uh, Beer Sheba Grotto, that's coming up soon. So, oh yes, why yes, yes we are on the twenty seventh. Yeah, so that'll be a good time having a, a brand new grotto that uh, also meets in a bar. So that's we gonna get back to those Tun Tavern kind of days, and I don't know. I guess that's it. Uh, Larry, yo, why don't you uh, take us out of here? Oh, are we ready to go home? Jeez. 
<coughs> Special thanks to uh, After the Lodge 665 for making their... You know, I'm really getting tired of saying that. Thank you, After the Lodge, for keeping our lodge heated and open, although we haven't been there since March. So it's the only thing I can thank them for, and they will thank them for it, and we appreciate it. We hope to get back there really, really soon. Uh, thanks to Josh Lamberton, our producer and director, who continues to make the show great. Thanks, Josh. Thanks to Jack Harley, our news director, and Jimmy Dedman, our marketing director, who started to do a really great job after about two and a half years. <laughs> 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 uh, I like uh, contributors Michelle Snyder, Jim Stevens. I don't, why am I saying Jim Stevens? He's not doing anything. Uh, maybe I'm thanking him for what he did in the past, but also Which is to okay. the great Douglas Maddenford, who is PA's Dutchy Doug. God, we love you, man. Also, too, uh, I, I had a story to tell, but you know what? This has been such a good show tonight. I'm not going to ruin it. Like closing with a lousy joke. So I'm going to say thanks for listening. This is Larry Maris. Have a good day. Good night. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Mark, thank you so much. We really, it was great.